you know, I mean, we're like a day away from officially being in St. Patrick's Day, so I think we should talk another Irish kind of film. Yeah. I'm going to try my best to say, ah. Oh, okay. Uh, if, no, no. I won't. If it no, happens in no, the middle, no, I'm not going to. We're just going to go ahead and just try to work through it. No, okay? I will never do that. Right. I'm going to keep. <laughs> we're my, not going to end the episode too with our best Boston impressions. I'll never try avoid that. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are talking the Departed today, um, and I think we're going to come at it from a few different perspectives. Because Nick, am I correct? Have you seen Infernal Affairs? The film is based on a long time ago. Right? Okay, so you've got yeah. a little bit of insight on that. I actually yeah. have not seen Infernal Affairs, so we might have a little bit uh, of a different take on it here. But I'm excited to talk about this film because it. Uh, you know, was was the film that finally got Marty his his favorite golden Marty's statue? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot there's a lot going into that, and a lot to you know deep dive into, especially with a film as layered and uh, with so a multitude of such big name character actors um, all around it. So I'm really excited took, to talk uh, about the film. Took Marty Scorsese to get another Marty in his film to get a best picture. It's not a bad idea, but maybe you <laughs> should just kept doing it. Um, hey, folks, this is Kyle and Nick on film. Uh, I'm Kyle Gothi from GoFilmReviews.com. And I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Uh, we're going to talk about one of the best pictures, of course, featuring Jack Nicholson, of course. Yeah. yeah. The Departed. Back to Kyle and Nick on film, and again today we're talking The Departed, yeah. director Martin Scorsese. Sorry, Jack Nicholson, and this is the first time they ever worked together. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like with Al Pacino, where it's like, how have they not worked together at this point? You know? <laughs> I remember when this came out, and it was in Empire Movie Magazine, published in a long time ago, that Marty and Jack confessed that a lot of the times things were delayed because they would sit and talk movies and old movies for hours and hours, and nobody had the courage to okay, stop, guys, we're going to make a movie while we're doing this. <laughs> but I don't think you'd tell them to stop. Right, um, who's going to tell them? You, you the PA? You I think it's to... kind of like, actually, I remember uh, Kubrick, I think it's Kubrick, used to have like a chess board out when he was filming, and, and he kind of did the same thing, and I think he played chess with Jack Nicholson for The Shining. So really, <laughs> Jack Nicholson seems to want to do anything but work. But, work, um, right, yeah. but when he does, he turns in some pretty cool performances. Yeah. Um, so for those of you guys that haven't seen the film yet, where have you been? Um, the film stars Leonardo DiCaprio as Billy Costigan, who no. is a cadet, uh, a police cadet that kind of gets... Infiltrates. Yeah, yeah he infiltrates uh, Jack Nicholson's, uh, Frank Costello's empire. Yeah. Going in from it, he's a cop who is playing like he's a bad guy. At the same time, we have Matt Damon's character, Colin Sullivan, uh, who's a, a cop that is a bad guy playing as a cop in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of watching this weird wheel kind of play out. It's a really stellar concept. Yeah, um, it's very um, based on Infernal Affairs, which is this is the American version of it. Mm -hmm. um, but in Asian culture, this is played upon a lot of dualities. Yeah, y yin and yangs, right? Mm -hmm. This is projected of a yin and yang throughout the whole movie of duality. Yeah, and yeah. I think watching our two uh, cop villain crossovers between Damon and DiCaprio, I think is such a, it's such an interesting cat and mouse and cat and mouse. Yeah, um, where there's yes. two cats, two mice, and they're just yes. circulating each yeah. other. Um, and we're not sure really even like which one of them is, is going to topple first. It's such a compelling character study. It's such a compelling uh, and multi-layered story too where it's like, I'm not even entirely sure I really got all the pieces of the puzzle watching it the first time. It's one of those I think you enjoy the, the pieces and, the, and the, you don't really care the, what the resolution is going to be. You just love the, the journey and how they... You want to see how it ends though. You want to see like, it right, yeah. But I but think not... like the way... And we're not going to talk deep dive spoilers here, but the, the film has some shocking twists and turns, especially near the end of the film, right, yeah. um, where it ends up. And I think that's that's a really, again, like ballsy move is to kind of take the route that they take with it, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, it plays on your perceptions of who you think is a bad guy, who you think is a good guy, mm -hmm. and cops and robbers. And everybody has a philosophy that cops and robbers, the only difference is cops have a badge. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of that like... No one is 50-50 good-bad. Everyone yeah. leans towards one way, but it's almost like everybody has good tendencies and bad tendencies. And right. that's not just the Damon or the DiCaprio. There's parts of, like, Jack Nicholson. There's parts of Mark Wahlberg, Martin Sheen. Like, so many people in this film who have a dark side but are light characters or a light yeah. side of dark characters. Right, even, like, Ella Baldwin's character who she pre presents this shield of just anger, corruption, and awful but you know deep in sound he's a big jelly he just wants yeah. to be a good guy his machismo is just this giant wall i kind of yeah. i kind of think about it, it's like his character from glengarry glenn ross just decided to become like a law enforcement person like yeah. <laughs> because he he just plays up these like 
Oh, yeah, he plays up bigger, you know, holier than thou, large yes. scale characters, and he does it in a really believable way. Yeah. Um, it's probably why his recent SNL turns have been so popular. And I love to play with him and Moff Warburg, how they have to one up each other. Does it in a second yeah. play that they like each other? And how you present how you like each other in a macho culture is you just give out the be word, the best insult. Yeah, it's like they don't realize how similar they are. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> Which is plays on the dualities, right? They both know they're how equal they are and how different they are. Yeah, and that's so true too, because you see yeah. the interactions between like let's say like the Vera Farmiga character who is, you know, who begins to date the Matt Damon character, but she also begins to uh um I guess be the shrink to the DiCaprio character. Yep. You see the interactions with Martin Sheen's uh, Dignum and the Mark Wahlberg character, yeah. both working with DiCaprio. So you see like two versions of everything. Yeah. Um, and I think that again, like which one of these two is a better choice? Kind of like we get we get presented with so many different choices throughout the film. Yeah. I don't know if I would make the same choices as them. I don't know if I would make the right choice either. <laughs> um, Powerful film though it won a lot of Oscars when it when it came out Best Picture Best Director Best Adapted Screenplay Best Editing it was even nominated supporting for Wahlberg um, which I think is pretty crazy that like of all the people in the film he does have a great performance of course but like for all the that people you know that's... all the people in the film that he's the only one <laughs> nowadays they have an award for Best Assembled Cast mm -hmm. they didn't do that back then and I think this would definitely be up there for Best Assembled Cast I think, cast so, yeah. I think yeah. this would have garnered some really serious SAG nominations uh, and. And probably quite a few wins. Yeah. Um, the score from Howard Shore, uh, very powerful stuff. You know, he did Spotlight and, and the the Middle Earth films. Of After this, yeah. I can see the Spotlight kind of like influence where he's going to go with Spotlight in this film. There's a very well, Departed you know, and Spotlight both from Boston. Yeah, Boston. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. true. And then just kind of like just the beat of the overall film is kind of like a, a recognizable uh, thumping, if you will, <laughs> that you can really kind of you keep moving along with. Yeah. I think again, both films are lengthy dialogue heavy films that that music keeps you kind of yeah. moving on through it um i think it was funny that uh, leonardo DiCaprio described his character billy costigan as as being like in a constant 24-hour panic attack it looks like and watching that film like i yeah. got to imagine he probably had some heart problems when he was done just because he is just so wound up tight right um and you see a lot of like where you as a character could go um yeah. like i would really be I, I would really have a lot of trouble doing what he does in this movie. I like that there's small little instances of Matt Damon's character and Leonardo's character actually having sympathy for, a, you know, for the other side. Mm -hmm. So you even see even Leonardo having sympathy for the bad guys occasionally. And oh, then you have yeah. Matt Damon actually being a cop and doing cop stuff and having sympathy for what the cop's doing, even though he's an awful person and they're going to die because of him. Right? Yeah, like he's he's intentionally putting his crime before his... Yeah. His brothers, if you will, whereas uh, DiCaprio is putting his his cop skills before his crime. Yeah. But you know that they have to bleed through each other. Yep. And it's this wicked dance that we get. To and watch. you actually have moments where you actually feel at least a little empathy for Jack Nicholson's character. Mm -hmm. It comes out just a little bit, not all the time. Yeah. The beneath the levels of perfect casting, Jack Nicholson is like yeah. the insane mafioso. Um, there's that great moment where he's, you know, doing cocaine and it's just like, he's just outside right. in this like snowy, you know, weather kind of an area. And I don't, I, I actually appreciate that Marty does that. He sneaks into those little dream sequences, mm -hmm. a little superimposed imagery and at least recognizing that there's a movie. Yeah. And in kind of a similar way to, I think Tarantino gets a lot more recognition for this, but yeah. Scorsese tends to make his villains cool. Yeah. You know, like, he, he gives them a moment where they really get to shine. Yeah. And maybe it's because he deals so much with villains, villains as the uh, protagonist yeah. that, you know, he's just used to making his character. Like, you want to at least follow the characters to their eventual doom or, or success. Yeah. But, yeah, he definitely makes Frank Costello a person that you, you want to watch him. <laughs> yes. even, even if he doesn't go down. You want to watch him win. You want to watch him lose. You want to be a part of that. Um, on the flip side, though, I really, really, really like Martin Sheen. In this film, it is such a yeah. uh, a smaller, subtle performance. He's a father figure to Leo. No, this is not a very loud actor. No, no, a loud, no, loud character, mm -hmm. right? Everybody has, everybody gets to be get to be loud in this movie, and here's Martin Sheen being soft and yeah. actually grounding everybody. Um, I talk about it a lot of time in, when I do writing workshops, and we always have this conscientious character, which is a character that somehow 
projects that maybe he knows he's in a story and he mm-hmm. actually has to navigate and he knows that this is not going to turn out good. Martin Sheen in this movie kind of looks like a conscientious character in this, that he's grounded why everybody's mm. playing out with this. Yeah, and he's kind of, he's trying to guide people towards good. Yeah. And, and you know, trying to push us into a, a happy conclusion. Yeah. Whether or not he's successful in that is up to, up to. But he looks like he knows this world is not going to, it's not going to be good, no mm. matter what happens. That's true. Yeah, he's, he's kind of a lot of ways like the voice of reason. Yeah. Um, it's almost like, like James Gordon is always a conscientious character. That's true. What I regard it. Like, no matter what is going on, it's not going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, he's just gonna try and write it as much as he can. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny too with the the Sheen thing. I I remember when I initially watched this film, right when when it came to home video because I missed it in the theaters. Um, I one week later watched Apocalypse Now for the first time Which and saw amazing. Martin Sheen in a very different role. Right. And I remember seeing at the end of that movie, I was like, man, that guy can act just because you see these two completely different takes. That's on a hard people across his life transition from that movie. Um, yeah. So it's definitely like again, it, it made me feel all the more proud of his understated performance. Especially, in a, you know, he's he's a quiet dog in a room full of big, angry dogs in this movie. There's so many people that are just yelling for space. <laughs> I mean, and you can play loud characters. I mean, mm-hmm. go watch the movie Spawn, and he plays a loud, aggressive, angry yes, he does. bully. Mm-hmm. Yes, he does. <laughs> yeah. So he can do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess for me, I, I think, too, like, this is the only remake of a foreign film to win Best Picture. Yes, um, which I forgot about that already. Yeah. Too. Uh, no other film has accomplished that. And I think it's probably it's probably because this film is so standalone. It's by itself. Part of that is not having the same title as the original film, no. but also to uh, remaking the spirit of the film, That's as what opposed it to remaking the story of the film. Right. So you mentioned it's, there's some similarities between the two. So the one really large, large similarity is the um, Matt Damon Leonardo character having their confrontation on the rooftop. That happens in Infernal Affairs, that the two characters have their confrontation on the rooftop, mm-hmm. which is a very strong metaphor. Who's going to take over the city, right? Yep. Is it the cops or the bad guys? Yep. Well, as the cityscape plays over. Like a King of the Hill thing. Like, kind of. Like, going to kick yeah. the other one off yes, the top. Yeah. Um, and a lot of characters translate over to um, The Departed, much like Alec Baldwin's character and Matt Wolfer's character. Our character is similar in Infernal Affairs. The one big standout is the difference is Jack Nicholson's character. There's nothing really like that in um, Infernal Affairs and Departed. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, okay, we're going to the Boston. Boston knows this very famous guy named Whitey Bulger, and this is mm-hmm. kind of the emphasis build up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can definitely see elements of that in. Uh... In Whitey Bulger kind of like being like an inner version of Frank Costello. And it actually plays on what Frank Costello did in this movie where he played both sides. Mm-hmm. That's true, yeah. Um, I, for me, again, not having seen the Infernal Affairs, but like yeah. knowing that you know William Monaghan wrote this film, I, I got to imagine he went through a number of drafts of the screenplay, ranging from like the first being a lot closer in like tone. But what he did was, yeah, just embracing the spirit and... and Making a completely different film that's got the skeleton of Infernal Affairs. Yeah, because the dressing up of, of, of it's a little bit different. The, the cutting, the fast pacing of it is in Infernal Affairs. It looks like an action movie almost. Like mm-hmm. boom, boom, boom. Where this one sets in, let's set up the scene like Marty's fingerprints are all over it. Yeah, and, and then getting like a director with such a distinct tone and oh, voice yeah. and style like Scorsese, who I don't think watched Infernal Affairs before making the film, which was a great I choice. I think that's how to do that. Yeah, I think that was healthy. Um, I think I think you're you're gonna get yourself in trouble by by yeah. seeing what the film was before because you're gonna be thinking about it. Whereas it's almost like he he made this movie not thinking that it is a remake. No. Because it's it's in yeah. a lot of ways it is, in a lot of ways it isn't. And I, uh, best translation I could say like Seven Samurai and Magnificent Seven and Magnificent Seven is a remake of Seven Samurai they're completely different other than just the template left over yeah and the same thing I mean the same thing's true with yeah, Yojimbo to the uh, Fistful of Dollars like right yeah we, I think I think that's the way we should embrace remaking foreign films um, there's a number of films right now that are like being discussed for English language remakes um, you know, Parasite now is getting like a, a HBO limited series that we're not sure if it's like a remake of the show or a continuation or like an inverse universe thing. Happening. But like, that's that's the right way to do it is do something different with the property. Right. Um, there's so many foreign language. Like, because again, like, if you can get past that one inch of subtitles on the screen, you can enjoy so many more films. Bong Joon Ho said it better than I did. But uh, like, they're 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 there. You can go watch them. Yeah. If you're gonna make them in America. 
make something that is um, an American film with the yeah. skeleton of that. We see this a lot, though, like the Grudge remake that we talked about. Uh, right. you know, we talked about yeah. the newest sequel for that earlier this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked about that earlier this year, though, where, like, that film was basically just the same movie in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, didn't really try to make an American version of it. And I think that's, that's where you come into contact is when you make a film so similar to its original, you're right. you are just comparing right. the two that. Yeah. It's tough to compare The Departed and Infernal Affairs. I think it, absolutely. And especially go back and, and watch some of you know what happened in Asia in the early 2000s. They were making fantastic movies. Mm -hmm. Infernal Affairs was probably one of the cream of the crop. Yep. And so once you see The Departed, watch Infernal Affairs. If, you, if you've got Infernal Affairs on your desk right now, watch that and then watch The Departed. But, yeah. um, Which I always wonder why they never call it Internal Affairs. I know. I don't, I, it's more memorable do it right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> please because I, I, I always it's, it's, like, catch myself saying yeah. it wrong. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Nick, real quick, I guess, recommendation on The Departed. Departed's not actually the one that Marty got all the awards, but I don't regard it as one of his best pictures. Um, I do recommend it. It's a nice crime story. Jack Nicholson and Child Shines. It's a great ensemble cast. Um, it looks a little dated. It looks really early 2000s. It did feel a little bit more yeah. dated this time watching. It's been a, it's been a couple yeah. years, though. <laughs> yeah. So, with that, and then Mark Wahlberg really kicks it out, man. It's true, and, and no one talks about that. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe it's because he did The Fighter a few years later, which people kind of see as like a classic Wahlbergian Yeah, character. it was almost like Departed Part 2. Or, yeah. yeah, and and The Departed for him is, again, it's... I would say even as zany and crazy and over the top as he is, that's a subdued Wahlberg. Um, <laughs> for me, uh, it's a recommendation. I, I, I do actually, it's higher on my list of Scorsese films purely because uh, it was one of those films, I don't even know if I had seen Goodfellas or Casino at the time right, I watched uh, The Departed. I don't know if I'd seen many uh, of his films. I, I really kind of went through a cluster of them all at once where it was like Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, Casino, and Departed were all in this like, little like, chunk of time in my life. Um, so I, I see you it a your, lot of ways, you know. Yeah. I went through a real bloody 15 and 16 in my life. Okay. Uh, lots of murder there. Um, good thing okay. my parents weren't awake at 2 in the morning when I was watching these movies downstairs. Um, but for me, it's a, it's a definite recommendation. It's uh, a St. Patrick's Day regular in my household. My wife and I always tend to hit it up uh, right around St. Patrick's Day. Um, really fun to revisit at this time, though, and see kind of like, again, all the layers and really get to breathe it in. Um, recommendation for me. Nick, though, big question before we end the, out the episode. This is the film that won Marty his official Best Director Oscar and, and his first uh, you know, win that way. Yeah. Do you think it was a career Oscar or a film Oscar? Definitely career. Yeah. Everybody knows that. I mean, it's, it's not a big surprise. He should have won Best Director for Raging Bull or Goodfellas and just got skipped out on him. Um, yeah, but he's deserving of it. Yeah, and to me, I look at the films that were, that were nominated alongside it um, I, I really like Little Miss Sunshine. I li really like yeah, that. That's a little go. It, um, perfect title for the movie. It's just go go. It's yeah. a little. It's a little movie that could right. But at the time that it came out, I remember thinking to myself, like, I wanted Little Miss Sunshine to win Best Picture. I was really pushing for yeah, it. Yeah, everybody liked it. Um, that, that little underdog and movie. I yeah. really, really liked Babel that came out. Yeah. Um, for Alejandro uh, Gonzalez and Yuritu. Yeah. And I was really pushing. I love both those movies more than The Departed, but here's the thing: I watch The Departed more often. So what does that say about me? <laughs> I really think like the movie has continued to grow with me over time. Yeah. Um, because I was against it winning Best Picture. I was like, no, oh, this doesn't need to win. Uh, you know, shows what I know. But uh, I, I actually think the film has grown with me more. So I, I will say, I think um, the Best Director win is a career win, but I do think the film was deserving of Best Picture. There you go. I agree with that. Go. Yeah. Perfect. So guys, there's our thoughts on The Departed from Martin Scorsese. Have you seen the film? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Um, are, do you think Infernal Affairs is better, or do you think Departed is better? Yeah. You know, Let us know in the comments section below. Like the video if you like the video. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Um, definitely as well, yeah. we've got our Patreon. If you just look below this video here, there's a link to the Patreon page where you guys can join up with the Kyle and Nick on Film Community. Please uh, read some of the crazy posts that we've got on there. Uh, and help contribute to different films that we're going to be talking about in future episodes. we got a lot of big plans for 2020 here, um, and I'm excited to, uh, yeah, to share cool. them with you and let you share some ideas with us as well. So, uh, Nick, where can we find you out there? Uh, St. Paul Filmcast, where I host. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Perfect. And you can catch all my uh, many reviews on GoatFilmReviews.com. You can follow me on social media at AlmightyGoatMan, or you can find our Facebook page there too, GoatFilmReviews. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Have a great St. Patrick's Day. Be safe, and uh, we'll see you next time.